Institute's educators, the founding member of a social equality educators re re uh, recipient of the Abe Keller Foundation, as well as winning the Secondary Teacher of the Year back in 2013, winning the Special Achievement Courageous Leadership Award, winner of the King County and Seattle NAACP Award, named the Education Fellow to the Progressive Magazine, as well as a Cultural Freedom Fellow for the Lenon Foundation, for his national recognized work in promoting critical thinking and opposed high stakes tests, let's have a warm activist for today's speaker and educator and activist, Jesse Hagopian. Thanks everybody. Uh, it's great to be back here with you all today uh, at Seattle Central. Um, thank you to the college. Thank you to Mary and Lyles for having me today. Um, it's an important time that we come together and have a discussion about race and education and fighting oppression because we have the current overseer of the school to prison pipeline on her way to our town. Uh, you guys know Betsy DeVos is coming tomorrow. Uh, I hope to see a few of you down at the rally. She's going to be speaking at a $350 a plate dinner. I don't suppose I'll see many of you around the dinner table. Uh, but she is coming to speak in our town about her vision for the schools. And I helped to organize two teachers across the region to come let her know what we think of her message. And so I actually wrote an open letter to the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. Come on in. <clears throat> Come on in, grab a seat. Um, I wrote this open letter to Betsy DeVos that I want to start off reading to you guys. And then I want to talk about what it's actually going to take to confront her, but go far beyond one individual to change a whole education system and a social system to make it about empowering students rather than just sorting you into an unequal economic system, right? So that's the discussion I want to have today. Um, so I'm glad so many people are filling in now. Welcome. Come on in. So here's the letter I wrote. It was published in the Progressive Magazine yesterday. I'm so sorry, one second. You guys, yeah. if you could please move into the middle. If you could just move That's good advice. Don't leave seats in between you, because I'm going to college. Let's make sure everyone has a chance to All right. Yeah, no problem. No, I'm happy to get people settled. Cool. Move on in the middle. How you doing? We're mostly here. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Um, so let me read you this letter that I published in the Progressive Magazine yesterday. Open letter to Betsy DeVos explaining why we're not exactly rolling out the red carpet for her here in Seattle as one of the uh, most reviled members of the Trump administration. I said, Dear Betsy, my name is Jesse Hagopi and I teach ethnic studies at Seattle's Garfield High School. I hope, I, I hope you didn't just stop reading this letter after, after you heard the subject I'm teaching. I urge you to keep reading. I'm writing in regards to the Washington Policy Center's $350 a person fundraising dinner you will be addressing on October 13th at the Hyatt Regency in the nearby city of Bellevue. Thousands of my colleagues and I will surround the building to make sure the world knows that your message of division is not welcome here. Given the recent protests of your speeches at Harvard, at the historically black Bethune-Cookman University, and many other places, you must be getting used to this by now. But just so there are no surprises, let me tell you what to expect. There will be bullhorns, signs, speeches, and I bet some of the more creative teachers, perhaps the few art teachers that are left, if your proposed budget cuts haven't yet cut them, 
will show up in grizzly bear costumes referencing the asinine comments you made defending the use of guns in school to protect us from <laughs> grizz potential grizzlies. There will be students there questioning your qualifications to serve as Secretary of Education given that they have more experience with the public schools than you. They might point out that you have never attended public schools and neither have any of your children. There will be black people there and civil rights organizations because you refuse to say if the federal government would bar funding for private schools that discriminate. Right? And these anti-racist activists will protest your claim that the historically black colleges and universities are quote pioneers of choice as a way to promote the privatization of public education as if the segregation that forced African Americans to start their own schools was some sort of magnificent choice. There will be feminists protesting your outrageous dismantling of Title IX protections aimed at reducing sexual assault on campuses. Your decision to meet with these sexist so-called men's rights groups that uh, decide on to decide on your approach to Title IX policy shows just how little regard you have for protecting victims of sexual assault. As Mara Kessling, the executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality, said, "Quote: She's meeting with groups and individuals today who believe that sexual assault is some sort of feminist plot to hurt men." There will be transgender people and others in the LGBTQ community protesting your decision with the Attorney General Jeff Sessions to pull back public school guidelines allowing transgender students to use bathrooms for the gender they identify with. And while you have stated you don't support gay conversion therapy, the Washington Post has cited that you served from 2001 to, to 2013 as the Vice President of the Edgar and Elsa Prince Foundation, which donated to anti-LGBTQ groups that do. College students will join us because of your attempt to stop debt collection regulations meant to protect students from predatory colleges. The borrower defense payment rules implemented under President Obama make it easier for defrauded student loan borrowers to obtain debt forgiveness. In addition, union members and, and uh, edu union educators will join the rally because of your unrelenting attack on organized labor. As Mother Jones Magazine wrote of your plan to push anti-union right to work legislation, these laws outlaw contracts that require employees in unionized workplaces to pay dues for union representation. Now, to be fair, I want to acknowledge that the destruction of public education didn't begin with you. When your predecessor, Secretary of Education Arne Duncan, came to town, uh, we protested him too. Uh, like you, he was committed to privatizing education. He just didn't have your zeal for the voucher approach. But Duncan was even more motivated than you to reduce an individual student's intellectual and emotional learning process to a single number on a test that could be used to punish a child, a teacher, or an entire school. Now, to truly transform our public education system so it empowers students to become critical thinkers and change makers, we must go far beyond removing just you from office. To achieve the schools our children deserve, it will require a mass grassroots uprising of educators, students, parents, unions, working people, the poor, LGBTQ people, women, people of color, and human rights organizations who are ultimately empowered to democratically run their own school system. Thankfully, all those folks will be at the rally tomorrow, so maybe we can start that conversation. See you in a couple days. Sincerely, Jesse Hagopian. <laughs> um, so I don't know if she's going to get the message, uh, but she'll definitely get it when she walks through a throng of thousands of us who have showed up to say we have a whole different vision for the purpose of education. And I think it's urgent that we transform our schools at every level, from kindergarten through college, into sites of resistance to this Trump administration. Um, and I think that 
you know, Donald Trump emblazons everything he owns with his name on the front of it, right? Everything from the Trump Tower to the Trump Golf Courses to the Trump University and on and on and on. That name that's synonymous with bigotry, sexual assault, racism, homophobia um, is plastered on everything he owns. And I think it's time that we start uh, declaring what we believe in in our public institutions like Lowell Elementary did right here, right? Saying that black lives are matter, uh, black lives matter at this school, or that immigrants are welcome at this school, or that we won't tolerate sexual assault at this school, right? Um, and boldly proclaiming that as, as we move forward uh, in this struggle. And I think one of the things that we should emblazon on our schools is that this school is going to work to disrupt the school to prison pipeline, right? That we are going to embrace restorative justice instead of zero tolerance discipline that's pushing so many kids, especially black and brown kids and disproportionately actually black girls out of, out of class, out of school um, and, and into a, a, a school to prison pipeline. Um, that school to prison pipeline to me is not a loose analogy. It's actually a very exact description of what I'm seeing being constructed from my classroom into jail cells. And what do I mean by that? Well, it starts maybe with a state legislature that is refusing to follow the state law, but of course they would never end up in jail for breaking the highest law of our land, which is the state constitution that says it's the paramount duty of the state to fully fund education. And the state Supreme Court found that our legislature is breaking that law and held them in contempt of court for refusing to fund education, and yet they walk around free, but our kids are being funneled into prison, right? And in fact, our state, not only do they criminally underfund the public schools, but then they go ahead and use $200 million to build a new youth jail, right? Have you guys seen uh, that struggle to try to stop the, the youth jail here in Seattle? Imagine what we can do with $200 million at Garfield High School, at schools across the city, to give after-school tutoring programs, to give trauma counseling, to, to give college counseling, right, um, to lower class sizes so that we can reach the needs of our kids, right, so that we don't have to end up with them in, in those facilities. Um, but I think if you want to really get at what the roots of the school to prison pipeline are, I think you have to start with what the kids are learning in the classroom. Because I think that oftentimes, what happens is you see a kid who's being disruptive in the class and they get labeled as defiant right away, right? And they get pushed out of the classroom and then oftentimes pushed out of the school. But maybe what we are seeing as defiance uh, to authority is better understood as defiance to a racist curriculum, right? A curriculum that doesn't actually contain the culture of the kids that are in our, our classroom, that doesn't reveal the struggles and contributions of people of color. And maybe it's actually those students are rejecting something that they have quite a right to do so. And let me give you a couple examples. I mean, there's, there's endless examples to give, but there's a couple of more prominent examples that I think people should be aware of. I want to show you a couple. Um, let's see if I can... Let's watch this one. This is from Texas. This happened two years ago. Um, a student was sitting in his in his um, geography class, and he opened. Teacher told him to open up the book, and uh, here's what he saw. To a local mother about how that company portrayed slavery in a book used by local students. I would assume reporter Caitlin McCulley is live at Pearland High School tonight to show us what that mother found in the textbook and what the publisher is promising to do about it. Caitlin. Hey Tom, a ninth grader here at Pearland High School opened up his textbook to read a passage about immigration. What he found was pretty shocking to him and his mother. So he has a copy of the book at home. Ronnie Dean Burren shared this cell phone video on social media. 
This is a part of the Texas textbook adoption. After her son, Kobe, texted her about an alarming passage in his textbook. About Africans coming over as workers. Kobe sent her this image, which reads, The Atlantic slave trade between the 1500s and the 1800s brought millions of workers from Africa to the southern United States to work on agricultural plantations. That map is under a section heading called Patterns of Immigration. Immigrants. Immigrants. Yeah. That, that word matters. In the next section, the text mentions English and European people. Many of whom came as indentured servants to work for little or no pay. So they say that about um, English and European people, but there is no mention of Africans working as slaves or being slaves. It just says we were workers. Dean Byrne contacted the publisher, McGraw-Hill, to express her concerns. The company responded on Facebook, saying in part, we conducted a close review of the content and agreed that our language in that caption did not adequately convey that Africans were both forced into migration and to labor against their will. Okay, you get the idea? Now, what's funny about this to me is that, okay, the textbook company McGraw-Hill apologizes for erasing forced bondage. And they say they're gonna change the language. But the thing about it is, did you notice what section of the textbook slavery is in? Immigration, right? We just got on boats to come over here looking for a better world, right? Not exactly. So the entire framework that's being used to talk about uh, one of the greatest crimes in human history is really, really wrong. and. You can't just change that by changing a couple words because you're placing it in the context of, of uh, immigration rather than forced uh, bondage, right? And, you know, of course this isn't an isolated um, incident. I want to show you something that from Connecticut last year. Here's the Connecticut Adventure, right? Um, the fourth grade textbook in Connecticut be, that had been used for many years. Uh, in Connecticut, and there's this passage. Um, Connecticut, compared to other colonies, Connecticut did not have many slaves. Um, they often cared and protected for them like members of the family. <laughs> I mean, you have to laugh to keep from crying on something as outrageous as this. That. You whipped your own family members, you sold your own family members away. This is what we're teaching fourth graders across the country. Now I want, I want to show you what impact this has on kids. Look at this worksheet this kid filled out. So how were slaves, slaves treated in Connecticut, the worksheet says. Now she wrote, slaves were treated badly and cruelly, but then she crossed it out. To put the, the quote right answer, slaves were treated like members of the family. I mean, can you imagine a black student in that class being subjected to that kind of humiliation and degradation? I mean, why would you not check out? Why would you not be defiant when this is the type of curriculum that is being taught, whether it's in Texas, in the South, or Connecticut up in the north. These, these are the narratives that are all too common in, a, in the school system. And I think that's where a school to prison pipeline begins. And then it continues when you have zero tolerance discipline policies where you uh, immediately suspend or sus expel students rather than actually trying to bring together the folks that had uh, an issue and a problem and try to um, reach a, a greater understanding. And so I think um, that there are two major ways that those who are in power in our society maintain their power. One is through force, just out and out brute force, and the other one is through ideology, right? So you have, in one way, they can control us through uh, a police state um, that cracks down on anyone who dissents, right? And we saw that with the Occupy movement that was pointing out the fact that there is huge wealth imbalance today. 
the five richest people have as much wealth as the bottom 3.5 billion people on the planet. Let me just let that sink in for a second. There are five individuals who have more wealth than half of the entire planet. That is an obscenity that has caused all sorts of problems in health and education and the general welfare of humanity, right? And how do you maintain that sort of dramatic inequality? Well, when people protest like the Occupy movement or <clears throat> when people in the Black Lives Matter movement or women's rights movement raise their voices, you bring in the police to clear the streets and crack heads. We've seen it over and over again at demonstrations everywhere across the country. But that's not their preferred way of rule. Because if they're constantly having to crack down on people, right, it, it produces a lot of disruption in society. And so they prefer that you grow up learning your place in society, <clears throat> that you see it as normal and natural that we have inequality, that it's normal and natural to have racism and sexism and homophobia and dramatic wealth inequality. And so to do that, you have to have a sophisticated apparatus of media and, uh, and education that, that trains you to believe these things, right? One of, the, one of the, um, the most insidious methods of getting you to believe in inequality is this high stakes testing. Because it worked really well on me for a lot of my life. I was a terrible test taker. I didn't do well. Uh, on standardized tests and it made me feel really unintelligent right and then I knew you know if I didn't do well if I didn't make it very far in society it was simply because I wasn't as smart as my peers right and then you have this ranking and sorting system that says well these people did really well so they're good enough to run society these people did okay so they'll be in the middle and you didn't do well so that means you're set for a low wage job Right? And that, that kind of system goes far too often unquestioned in our public schools. And too often we don't ask, what, really, what are these tests measuring? Are they measuring your ability to solve a problem, to work together with others, to identify real issues in your society that need fixing and, and to solve them? Not at all. Right? And so we see that the school system needs dramatic restructuring. Um, and this is why I've been so um, dedicated to building one aspect of the movement which erupted last year. Um, well, well, actually, two, two different big projects that I've been working on in the last couple years. One, um, I started a fund called the Black Education Matters Student Activist Award. Uh, and in 2015, I was giving the final speech at the Martin Luther King Day rally downtown. And a few minutes after that, I was pepper sprayed by the Seattle Police Department, just hit in the face as I was standing on the sidewalk talking to my mom on the phone. And, um, you know, that was a really um, arduous experience. It was horribly painful. It was my son's second uh, birthday party that day so I was on my way to get a ride for my mom to go to the party and it was traumatic for my for my son to see the type of pain I was in it was disruptive to his party so that was that was hard but the whole experience of having to uh, of launching a federal lawsuit against the Seattle Police Department was uh, incredibly difficult and stressful um, but eventually I merged with a, with a settlement from the Seattle Police Department that I dedicated to giving to students who are organizing against institutional racism. So every year I give away a thousand dollar award to Seattle public school students that are fighting back against injustice. Uh, and um, coupled with that last year, we were able to launch the Black Lives Matter at School movement and it started with an elementary school in Seattle, um, John Muir Elementary. And they wanted to have this wonderful event to celebrate their black students at the beginning of school. And they were partnering with a group called um, Black Men United to Change the Narrative. And 
the, the teachers designed a shirt that said Black Lives Matter on it, and they wanted to all stand outside of school and high-five the kids on their way into school and then have discussions about race and diversity in the school that day. Well, the media found out this event was going to happen, and then a uh, website, uh, Blue Lives Matter, found out about this event, and then um, people started writing in all sorts of uh, hateful um, threats against the school. And one person even um, made a bomb threat of an elementary school for their audacity to declare that their black students' lives matter. And uh, at that point I said, this, this is outrageous. We have to figure out a way to support this school. And you know, these teachers and community members had great courage because even though the school district officially canceled that um, welcoming celebration of their black students because of the threats, they, they carried it forward anyway, just with maybe a few less people than would have, would have been there anyway. But I wanted to show that school that we stood in solidarity with them. And so we put forward a resolution um, inside the Seattle Education Association, the union that represents the educators. And I said, we should all wear the shirts. They can't threaten every school in Seattle, right? And I thought, you know, it was a good sentiment, but I thought, you know, maybe a few dozen teachers would wear it. Um, and it would be a good start. We probably won't get every school. But what happened last year on October 19th was absolutely breathtaking. We started getting orders for the shirts just flooding in. And then by October 19th, over 3,000 teachers ended up wearing shirts to school that say Black Lives Matter. And many, many hundreds of teachers taught lessons that day about institutional racism, about the school to prison pipeline, held discussions about what this movement is, is all about. And it was really um, transformative. And it coincided with the students actually standing up for themselves. People may have seen recently that NFL players have been raising their fists or taking a knee, right? Um, started by Colin Kaepernick last year to highlight police brutality. Um, and then carried on this year by Seattle Seahawk Michael Bennett, who's been courageous in continuing the movement forward. And then it erupted when, when President Trump uh, called the players who take a knee SOBs, right? Only he set it out and, and then um, th wanted them to get fired for it, right? Over 200 NFL players pro, you know, participated in that protest uh, that day. But folks should know that Garfield High School was one of the first schools in the whole country where the entire team took a knee last year, right? And then it wasn't just the football team. It was the marching band and the cheerleaders at the same time. And then the women's volleyball team all took a knee. And then that spring, the girls' uh, soccer team also took a knee. So it became uh, a mass wave of protests. And I think it was the students' initiative that helped embolden the teachers to take that step in, in being willing to publicly declare that their black student lives uh, matter and were worth fighting for. And so that is, um, that's really where I think we want to we want to build on because this year um, we've seen that movement spread. So the end of last year, two other school districts took up the Black Lives Matter at school movement in Philadelphia and in Rochester, New York. And now we've had a conference call with teachers from Philly, New York, New Jersey, Baltimore, Detroit, several other cities that are planning a whole week of action this year during Black History Month. Black Lives Matter at school, and I'd encourage everybody here um, to, to continue to follow this movement and figure out if it's something that you all can bring to your own campus and what it would mean to make your own uh, institution fully value um, black lives that are often so casually discarded in, in, in our system. Um, and I just want to 
um, end on a, on a last note and then have time for, for questions today. Um, but I think that in this struggle for social justice, um, education and schools are such an important place to join in to access that struggle. I want to show you a, um, what, what it can look like here are some of the, um, the photos of what it looked like that day last year on October 19th at schools across Seattle, right? Um, you know, hundreds of teachers, thousands of teachers out front of their buildings um, and students with banners up writing what it would take to make Black Lives Matter truly matter in our schools, um, this outpouring of struggle. And I think that schools um, are a really unique space in our society that are important places to build this movement for social justice because schools have a really contradictory purpose in our society that I think creates explosive struggles. So on the one hand, we're told that schools are this wonderful place to unlock human potential, right? And to have you realize your dreams of, and help you fulfill your best self. And on the other hand, though, we know that people like uh, Betsy DeVos and Donald Trump see schools as a place to actually inculcate discipline, right? To make you, to discipline the next generation uh, of workers in order to fit you into a low-wage economy, right? To have you uh, blindly, obediently follow orders of someone who's in power, and have you not question things, and have you have your uh, have everything being about rote memorization, right? And so there's a great tension about what the real purpose of education is about, and that tension can often lead to to students erupting in struggle, right? It happened in the last great uprising of social struggles in the 60s and 70s, and we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Black Panther Party here in Seattle. There's gonna be a whole lot of um, commemoration of, the, of that in Seattle in April that folks should take a look at, and the founding of the, of the Seattle chapter was from a Garfield High School student named Aaron Dixon. Um, who, you know, um, helped to found the first black student union at the universe at, at Garfield and then at the University of Washington. And, you know, they say that these schools were great places to unlock human potential, but then there wasn't a single book written by a black person used in any course at the University of Washington when Aaron Dixon went to school there in, in 1968, right? So they had to form the Black Student Union and, and fight to transform public education. Um, and I think that much of their work is still left undone to us and it will take a great struggle to complete that work. And I just want um, to end on a quote from this book, From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation. Has anyone seen this book? Kianga Yamada Taylor. Um, I think this is one of the most important books um, right now about the direction of this, this struggle for racial justice. And she writes, the Black Lives Matter movement from Ferguson to today has created a feeling of pride and combativeness amongst a generation that this country has tried to kill, imprison, and simply disappear. The power of protest has been validated for it to become more, even more effective to affect the police state and withstand opposition to attempts to infiltrate, subvert, and undermine what has been built, there must be more organization and coordination in the move from protest to a movement. And that's really where I think uh, we need to go in, in this struggle for social justice. So thanks for having me here to start this dialogue. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, one second. I have a couple of former students here. 
Yay, good to see you. What's happening? All right. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, actually, we need to get that um, website back up online. Um, you can go to um, Social Equality Educators, and um, we will post the link to it um, when they're ready. Uh, when they're ready to sell again, but you know we have a couple months, a few months until February. But I think you know we'll we'll put the link up, and you, people will be able to um, to get those for sure. Yeah, yeah, up there. The book is called From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation by Kianga Yamada Taylor. Yeah, incredible, incredible book. Folks, if you've read The New Jim Crow, another really important book about mass incarceration in the United States, Michelle Alexander, uh, who wrote that book, highly recommends this book as well. Um, and I just think there's such an important connection to talk about, you know, mass incarceration and the way our public school systems fit into that and fuel that. Yeah, what, it, what, you know, I'm also just curious what you guys are talking about in class. I know some of you are in the social justice class and what kind of questions are coming up in there and how that might relate to things that I raised today. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, how you doing? Good. Look, I got a few students here. This is wonderful. I, I, yes, absolutely. Remind, tell, remind me your name? Amber. Amber, that's right. Thank you, Amber. Good to see you again. <laughs> Yay. That's wonderful to see it. My former students thriving here. Any other questions you all have? Yeah. That's a really great question. I know because there's there's so much uh, self hate and self loathing for the all the oppression that we face. You start to blame yourself, right? And that's exactly what how the system is designed, right? That's how they keep people believing they're in their right place, and it's really really sad. Um, you know, I remember as a, as a student thinking maybe it's because I'm black that I'm not scoring as well on these tests, right? And that, that's horrific that we're teaching our young people that um, to, to load themselves. And so you're right, like we have to find strategies in the home um, and in I think our public institutions to begin to validate our, our kids. I think, you know, um, it can start with having discussions about what we're reading and seeing with kids at an age appropriate level. Um, you know, there's lots of important books that help young kids talk and discuss about race. And there's all this nonsense out there that if you talk to young kids about race, then you'll indoctrinate them. Um, and we want to actually have a colorblind society, but society is not colorblind, right? And so you're, you're, um, putting blinders on kids and injuring them if they're not able to understand the oppression that they're facing and they'll internalize it, right? So I think, you know, starting those conversations as things arise um, in the home and having uh, full discussions about the contributions that African people have made to society and to the world that are, that are hidden is really important. Um, but I think that as much as we need to do at home as individual families, we also have to fight to transform the, the public school system to make sure it is doing 
what it needs to do to reinforce those kind of positive messages to kids. Otherwise, they come to school and then they question really what if their parents are telling them it is right. And that's why I fought so hard last year to get ethnic studies in the Seattle public schools. It was an incredible struggle and I'll just say that um, the Seattle NAACP and the social equity educators that I'm part of um, and, and others partnered together to demand that the Seattle School District begin an ethnic studies program in, in the schools. It's outrageous that we don't have it already, right? I often, I teach a lot, those of you who have been in my class know, I, I teach a lot about how the ethnic studies department in Arizona was banned, right? They actually, the Mexican American studies program was eliminated from right-wing politicians. But we don't even have one here to eliminate, <laughs> right? So we can call ourselves liberal progressive Seattle because we don't ban ethnic studies, but we didn't have it to begin with. So I think um, that fight was so critical to supporting and nurturing our, our students' self-worth. Right? And we actually, through the course of the year, held several rallies and demonstrations, writ, wrote letters, petitions, um, and by the end of the school year, the school district issued a letter saying they will implement ethnic studies in the Seattle public schools, and they started a task force to begin that process. And I thought that was a huge victory for our kids here in Seattle. So. Um, and then my principal isn't, didn't wait for the school district to set up the program and just allowed me to begin teaching ethnic studies this year. So I'm actually teaching the first ethnic studies program. And it's just been an incredible start to the school year. You know, it's been wonderful to see these kids come in ready to talk about Charlottesville, you know, ready to talk about the protests in the NFL. Um, and all these discussions about race and inequality that are happening all over, we need to have them happen in school, right? So, yeah, I guess that's, that's what comes to mind. Other questions? I'm so glad you guys have a, a social justice class here. Like, let's just say what we want <laughs> and then design classes around having those conversations. Um, because it's just so desperately needed. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you think would be a good alternative for standardized testing? Yeah, that's a great question. And I actually wrote a book called More Than a Score that I would recommend um, to get more deep into the, the question. Um, so we definitely want to have ways to know what our students are learning and if they're gaining the key concepts and developing critical thinking in our classroom. So I'm not against assessment, right? But what standardized testing measures is not your intelligence, your aptitude, not even really the skills that you have mastered. It basically is a way of showing how you compare to other students, not whether you've mastered a subject. So what standardized tests produce is a bell curve, right? And so you have a few students here doing really well, a bunch of students in the middle, and a few students failing, right? That's what standardized tests show over and over again, this bell curve. What happens if the bell curve changes, right? What happens if a bunch of students start doing really well on the test and you don't have that nice curve anymore, it's more just like straight up, everyone's doing really well. Well then that test is labeled invalid because you can't have everyone doing well because then everyone would get into college, right? That would be a disaster, <laughs> right? So they actually um, recalibrate the tests or they just bring in new tests, right? You guys have probably been through who knows how many different tests. The average American public school student takes 112 standardized tests in their K-12 career now, right? So, you know, first we had the, the WASL was the state test, then the HISPE, now the SBAC, right? So they'll just change the test when more and more students do better to make sure you get that bell curve. And what the bell curve shows you is not your intelligence, but it shows you 
the, the number one thing these tests measure is your wealth and your access to resources and your proximity to the dominant culture, right? So you can show me a student's family's uh, assets and bank account and I can tell you where they'll end up on this bell curve, right? And it has to do with the biases that are built into the test. It has to do with the fact that those families can afford test prep um, to help the kids do very well on the test. Um, and it doesn't have to do with, with intelligence. But in terms of your question about the alternative, right, we actually have seen the alternative in practice um, in a whole lot of places, right? I think um, when you go to get your PhD, right, what do you do? You actually don't take a standardized test to see if you pass your PhD. You have to defend your dissertation, right? And that's a model we all know and respect and revere, but for some reason, we don't think, that, think to apply it to our classrooms in K-12. But actually, it's a very good method of understanding what students know. They can develop a thesis. They can do research over time to find evidence to back up that thesis. If the evidence doesn't support the thesis, you revise the thesis. You work with, a math, you work with um, an instructor or somebody to help. And then you have to defend your thesis in front of a panel of experts, right? And there's actually a school system in New York City. There's a, a network of close to 40 schools now that are called the consortium schools and they're fully public schools. They're not charters or privatized in any way. The only difference is these schools have a waiver and don't have to give standardized tests. And instead they use that PhD model. So if standardized testing was the key to producing outcome, good outcomes for students, for closing the achievement gap, quote unquote, for helping students of color, then these schools should be the worst schools in New York because they don't have the standardized tests, right? The only thing is they're the very best schools in terms of graduation rates, in terms of performance of black students. They have 80% of their black students accepted into college compared to like 30%, right, for the country. Um, there's incredible numbers that they've produced because the system of inquiry-based social justice approach to curriculum and then the performance assessment model rather than standardized testing uh, really empowers their students. And I think that's a method that I would like to see um, that we need to fight to get waivers for our schools here and around the country to, who will have innovative assessment models so that we can, I think, empower our students to really show what they know, right? Not we don't, I don't care if a kid is good at eliminating wrong answer choices. That's not a skill they're going to use the rest of their life, right? And that's what these test prep classes are good at. Teaching you how to eliminate wrong answer choices better than someone else. But are they good at actually teaching you how to confront racism or the real problems that we face in our society? And that's why we need different assessment tools. I guess I would just say to, to end on, on this, you should look up also the history of standardized testing. And once you, you understand that standardized tests were first introduced into the public school um, by eugenicists who were open white supremacists who designed the test to prove white supremacy. Um, and then lo and behold, their, their beliefs were reinforced. Uh, you can see how flawed a tool that these tests are, right, um, as a way to, to judge our students. Yeah. Uh, my name is Desiree Simons, and my, uh, I'm an English instructor, writing instructor, and my class is actually here. And uh, I appreciate the fact that you opened up with a written letter to DeVos, and um, I like to encourage students to remember that writing is part of the process, even if you think that you're not that great at it. It's a way of writing through and getting to your ideas about social justice and... Yeah. No, the, thank you. I mean, I was a terrible writer. I, school, 
was so painful for me because I knew I wasn't smart because the test proved it to me, so I never really tried. And writing is something that took me a long time to get to, and I'm so thankful that I have that as a tool. It, like you said, it, it's not just about like you write your ideas down, it's like through that process of writing, you clarify what you really mean. And you narrow, um, you can narrow your focus and make it so much more powerful and then figure out how to broaden it out and connect to other issues. I, I think, um, I'm really glad you brought your class today. Thanks for being here. And um, it's just such an important way to communicate our ideas, especially when you can put it up on your own blog and have it go all around the country and help change people's ideas about these issues. It's a powerful tool in the um, toolbox of social justice warriors. So um, keep at it, y'all. Appreciate you all. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.